Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Brian O'Leary, Executive Director of the Book Industry Study Group, and welcome to today's webinar on updating your metadata after publication. This is actually the fifth in a series of what we call coffee break webinars, so shorter form, generally about 30 minute webinars uh, that the metadata committee has put together starting last fall. Um, and we're actually lucky today to welcome back a couple of folks who did the first one to uh, give you some information about updating your metadata after publication. So we wanted to cover at least uh, four things today. The first uh, that we'll hear from Ralph Carviello on is how to communicate changes effectively. Uh, the second section led by Claire Holloway will be why am I not seeing my updates? She has the answers. Um, I will take your questions. So if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A panel that's in the control for this particular meeting and we'll pick them up at the end. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with some resources and we'll also show you a list of planned sessions from the metadata committee going forward. I mentioned them a moment ago, but our, our presenters today did the first of these five sessions. Uh, Ralph Coviello's but when was uh, Belker and ProQuest uh, and is a significant uh, contributor to many different uh, efforts that BISG is involved with. Claire Holloway, uh, now with OCLC, you may have last seen her in September at uh, Baker and Taylor Publisher Services, but she's just recently moved and we're fortunate, fortunate to have her at L as a representative at OCLC, but she's also the chair of our metadata committee. So welcome guys. And uh, I'm gonna start by turning things over to Ralph. Thank you, Brian. Claire, I'm really glad to be back here again with you to help share some of the things uh, we learned as uh, recipients and our activities on the BISD Metadata Committee. So for this first leg, I'm going to uh, take it, uh, how to communicate changes effectively, the basics. So one of the issues that uh, I see as a recipient working with a wide variety of publishers and distributors is when you're upgrading uh, from your current uh, situation, such as from Excel to Onyx 2.1 or from Onyx to 3.0, or even just getting into using a, any kind of metadata delivery system for the first time. Sometimes people run off and they invest a lot of time and effort without checking with their major recipients in advance about what they really need what their requirements are for the different types of formats. For example, if you're running Excel, you might wanna check uh, before you invest in Onyx 3, can your, you know, all your recipients support it? Uh, if you're going to uh, invest in uh, Onyx 2.1, you might wanna check if any of your recipients have retired uh, 2.1 and only accept 3.0. So these are important questions that you need to clarify depending on you know, who you work with. The different things that happen in addition is that people will jump ahead and even do things like drop off a brand new format to the uh, FTP and uh, it's no one's prepared. So you really wanna make sure that you give advance notice to your recipients so that they can test your files and plan to continue sending the previous format for as long as possible. Now, this is a key thing that I've run into is validating your files before they are sent. Obviously, for a lot of major providers, this, this isn't a big issue, but I've found a lot of people in transition, especially if they're going into Onyx for the first time or they're using one of the great services for doing it themselves, that they actually don't use a validation tool. So I've included a link along with my contact information in the chat to a Wikipedia page that has a variety of tools that are out there. And it's just like anything else, there are some that are expensive and some that are lower cost, but it's really important to make sure your files are validated and well-formed in order to speed the testing process and get you into production. Otherwise, uh, you know, you've put in a lot of effort to get your metadata out there to people and uh, the file might not get, you know, tested properly, it might sit in the queue and then get immediately rejected uh, with, and you have to start all over, or you're just dropping it off and it's not going to pick up and process about the, uh, uh, if it's not formatted and valid. So again, very critical. 
uh, importance working with your metadata recipients. So I think I've outlined a couple of the diff different issues. Uh, your recipients uh, might have you know, particular requirements that they have for the different types of channels they support. Uh, myself, I'm uh, involved with supporting two very different types of channels. And one has very stringent requirements because of what's going on in terms of actually hosting uh, ebook files, whereas the other one is more metadata only and it's more informational. So uh, each one has different uh, needs and uh, it's important to reach out and get uh, any guidelines that your recipients have so that uh, you can get test files to them that will work and get into production as quickly as possible and have your files processed uh, and getting out to, to everybody so you can sell your titles, which is of course your goal and have your books discovered. Including related products capturing all ISBNs. So this is something that's always been a great feature of Onyx that you can include related product information. This helps promote title linking so that people can find the different options as we've seen uh, today this is more important than ever as people are interested in, you know, uh, it, with getting audiobooks as well as print editions, as well as ebook editions. They want to know uh, one of the examples uh, I ran into is with the ebook platform we support. There was a critical transition two years ago. It's hard to believe it's been two years for all of us with the uh, pandemic uh, breaking out where libraries had to be closed down, uh, university bookstores had to be closed down, and suddenly schools needed to teach everyone online. And they needed that, and they found that very valuable uh, in our systems that you could find out, oh, there's an ebook edition available. We can switch to that and keep our course going online since we can't get a print book in and have it in our uh, warehouse uh, for, you know, and available in our bookstores and libraries. Conversely, as hopefully for all of us, things start to get back to normal later this year, we will see that uh, people might want to start switching back to print editions. Libraries might want to get that print edition in and know that it's available out there. Lots of people like to have audiobooks. So that's another option if you have the related product. So now we're on to the next slide here. Thank you, Brian. How to communicate changes effectively in practice. So one of the things that's out there as uh, options is full file versus delta file. And there's the potential for block updates, which uh, I will comment on. So a full file is, of course, the entire universe of your titles at that particular moment that you want to send out. And, and honestly, for smaller providers, this is not the worst thing if you just send a full file every time and incrementally adding titles uh, to it. Uh, but really, as you start to get larger, both for yourself and for your recipients, it's really important to inter integrate Delta files. Delta files allow you to send whatever you're adding or updating that particular week so that people can process a file faster because it's smaller. They're not having to manage a bunch of redundant data that to uh, update in their systems. That's actually not an update or a change at all. And then you can uh, explore depending on your situation and your recipients. Maybe you only send a full file update once a year or maybe on a quarterly basis. Uh, and this is a, a really important thing for, for your recipients. Now, block updates, this has a lot of potential, and uh, but similar to Onyx 3, I think you'll find that maybe it's slightly ahead of its time. And again, this is something I would strongly encourage you to communicate to your recipients to make sure that they can uh, work with that format uh, before you invest time and energy into creating something that you know, might not seem like a solution, but not, might not be one that could be put into effect immediately. Then managing status changes, forthcoming active removals for eBooks. So forthcoming, I don't know how long some of you have been involved with sending out metadata, 
But if you go back uh, uh, several years ago, we used to have an approach where everything was active and we did forthcoming based on a publication date. And this ran into some issues because sometimes publishers would want to change their publication date and you know, had delays for different reasons. And so the standard change, we have a code FC forthcoming status and you want to put out forthcoming. This is better, metadata best practices as in the guidelines that BIST has available on their site that people like myself and Claire have contributed to over the years. Forthcoming then is great and it helps the publisher control when the updates are going to go out uh, in terms of something is now available. And you know it's kind of uh, an extreme example, but something like you know the Harry Potter books that uh, they're in their heyday, it was very critical not to have titles going out and available uh, any earlier than was determined by, by the publisher. However, what we found is that people will send forthcoming and then they will not follow up when the publication date is actually active uh, to send an active status. So it's really critical that whenever you hit your publication date, you follow on and send an active status in your metadata files. This will ensure that your prices, your most up-to-date descriptions, and then people looking to purchase your books are aware that it's actually active and, and available. Conversely, if there's something going on and your publication date has come and gone, and it's actually being delayed for you know, different reasons, make sure to send out that updated publication date so that people aren't, uh, are aware that it's been delayed and has to be pushed back for whatever the reason may be. Ralph, I wanted to interject very quickly on this point because um, when I was sending out data, um, we traditionally, um, we didn't change the forthcoming to active um, you know, code 02 to code 04 in Onyx speak um, as proactively as you just suggested until I heard you speak a few years ago about that point. And I have, I, and then we, we were more proactive in that approach. And through the pandemic with all the pub date changes that were happening, I, I do believe that that may have um, helped us you know, just that we're changing the pub dates, we're making sure we're keeping track of the statuses. Um, and so just keeping an eye to that, I think is really important. I wanted to emphasize that because I found it very helpful as well. Very clear. And, you know, I'm glad to hear that, uh, you know, these types of efforts uh, have helped you in the past uh, in terms of the, getting the information out to people. I've, I've literally had people still say to me they expect that we update it based on the date. And again, that defeats the purpose of the forthcoming status. Uh, the control is placed with the publishers and their distributors to send out those, those changes. In terms of removals for ebooks, this is something I'm directly involved with with the ebook platform I support. And one of the things we've seen, and again, this is uh, something we all have to deal with, is there's been a big shift um, in the importance of ebooks, as we've seen in the last couple of years, as I said previously. And but removals are a big deal with ebook platforms, and this can be for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the things that's very distinctive about removals with ebook platforms is that the title may not be going away. Uh, entirely in the marketplace like it normally might have been in the print world. Uh, in this case, the title might only be coming out of that particular platform or that particular model, th things of that nature. And so using the specific type of removal codes can be really critical. And as we have listed a few of them here with canceled, withdrawn, out of print, these are effective codes. There's other effective codes like not no longer are titled, but withdrawn is a particular interesting char uh, characteristic in that in the print world, withdrawn was really a rarely used sort of uh, code. And it really indicates right in the definition and on the editor page that it's for legal reasons and it's really not how people use it. They're just, you know, they're saying, well, it's an ebook and it's not technically out of print, I'm just withdrawing it. 
from you. And this might be something as an industry we need to look at re redefining. There's technically another code permanently withdrawn that's more specific to withdrawing something that might be you know, uh, the recommendation or an adjustment. And out of print is a code that one can still use in the ebook field. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a, uh, it doesn't make total sense, right? It's ebook, it's never out of print, but publishers want to retire a title. It's uh, not, no, it's no longer valid. A new edition has come out. There's new information. So yes, it's, uh, it's an old but familiar term for all of us. And we, we really understand what it means. So then what if this book is no longer our product? So again, with ebook platforms in particular, just to give a comparison for our, the books and print database we support, when we get an update from a publisher that a title is no longer there or distributor, in the case of Claire's former employer, uh, what happens is the book is, is withdrawn, it's no longer theirs, we are agnostic, we just want to get the information right, and then relatively soon or simultaneously, we get an update from the new distributor or directly from the publisher saying, uh, yes, here is our active price supplier. This is where you can you know, get our book. It's actually uh, available here. However, with ebook platforms, there could be uh, contractual situations, collection situations, things that might need to be scheduled. So it's very important to be proactive about letting people know that you've switched a provider in terms of uh, your distribution for those channels so they can make sure that they continue to host your titles uh, with minimal disruption for you and for the clients that they're serving on the receiving end. Anything else to add to that, Claire? No, I was just to say you've, you've put forth some good recommendations for what, you're, um, what we need to look through. It, it segues pretty nicely into my part um, so um, I, I've got the big question of why am I not seeing my updates? And uh, contrary to what Brian said, I don't have all the answers, but I do have some experience um, and hopefully some insights to pass along. So if you followed all the best practices, the recommendations that Ralph just gave, um, why are there still issues? Why do you still not see your updates? And the trite answer is it's complicated. It's a, you know, it's a it's maybe not trite. It's it's actual a, a good answer. But there's a few things I want to focus on, places to pay attention to, um, so that you can hopefully um, uh, help yourself out. As a data sender, you need to engage with the problem. Um, don't just um, accept it. You know, engage with it and try to make it better. And then as a data receiver, you need to learn from the problems, learn from the questions that are being asked of you um, by your senders. Um, it is a two-way street, you need to work together. So the three places I wanted to work, uh, wanted to talk on were timing. So you need to think about the timing of when was the data sent. So traditionally um, in the US um, Canadian market, we're asking for data 180 days at least prior to publication. Um, you know, uh, when you put your page count in there at 180 days out, that's probably not going to be the end page count. There's many things that will change um, between then and pub date. Um, so you need to think about, you know, when are you releasing, you know, when are you making these changes? You want to make sure that you're reviewing your titles, your forthcoming um, titles. Um, I, I always recommended two to three months prior to that publication date um, so that you can give the, the um, supply chain, the data supply chain time to make um, updates to the data. So you as a sender, review your data, um, you know, about two to three months before pub date, make the changes that you need to make um, and give the, the um, recipients time to make those changes. If you're trying to make these changes on pub date, you're, you might be frustrated because they're not happening as quickly as you or your author, more like, uh, want them to be. So then when you do send them out, the other aspect of timing is the time it takes the recipient to pick up those changes. Um, you know, it's, um, did you uh, send a full file with thousands of titles in it? You know, that's going to take longer to process than a Delta. Um, you know, did you send um, the same file every day for a week and a half? You know, that's, <laughs> you know, you might get um, somebody annoyed on the other end. 
Um, you need to also appreciate that the receivers take time as well. Ask them what their schedule is. If you receive, you can say, if you receive this file on a Friday, when might I expect changes to be made um, to show on your site or in your system? So have a communication. Um, you know, traditionally, um, I always said two weeks, you know, give it two weeks, even though I know some take days, some take a month, um, but, you know, give it, give it two weeks. Another thing that, uh, another area to focus on is confirmation of the actual file. Um, was it actually received? You're trying to send, you're trying to do the best thing as a sender. You're trying to send these updates out, but did the receiver actually receive it? Did they process it? Did they, um, uh, not find any errors in it, you know? So validate your files first, make sure it's a, vi a valid file. Now solve that problem to begin with. But then also um, maybe you get a receipt from, your, from the data recipient, or if you're a data recipient, maybe you need to offer a receipt to the sender. It is a two-way street. Um, I've seen it both ways where you um, send um, updates into the void and hope that they stick and you have no idea if they do. And I've also seen um, uh, what I've tried to do actively um, was send a receipt back to the senders. We got this file. You can at least say you got the file. Um, so pay attention to that, the confirmation. And then the other thing is the coverage. Um, and I, I, this is an important part to me, the coverage of the update. Um, does the error that you're seeing if in a non-updated point, does it persist on all sites or is it just one? Um, if it's just one, can you talk to that recipient? Um, if, you know, as it says on the screen, sometimes you're not able to talk to somebody, but if you're able to take advantage of it. Um, and then perhaps um, they're looking to receive that data point in another way, or perhaps their schedules are behind. Um, and then here's the kicker. Um, you need to appreciate that data recipients are getting data from multiple sources, not just you. You may be the primary source. You may be the one that is um, uh, maybe deemed uh, closest to the truth, but there are ancillary sources that will come in and will either overwrite or perhaps complicate the issues with your data. So just be wary of that. Um, you know, look for secondary sources, um, meaning you know, Google your title, see what comes up. Um, and, um, and appreciate that, there, that the data um, supply chain is not a straight, um, a straight road between you and the recipient. There are other roads leading in. Claire, okay. Claire I just wanted to comment on that, that last part that this is something we, we, have, we have experience with. We do run into you know, people sort of putting us out as the source of all problems, which certainly is not true, I hope. Uh, <laughs> One of the things we will, we're always willing to do is uh, if you see something that is an issue, you can let us know. Uh, we're glad to verify if it's correct on our system. We're glad to uh, see if it is a client that we work with, that we can work with you to make sure we've updated it correctly and that we're communicating it out so that uh, we can work with you to make sure that they uh, update it. And sometimes just eliminating us and anyone we work with as a source of the issue uh, can help you then narrow it down and focus on where the problem might be. And mm -hmm. it, it's important to let people know uh, about changes in your distribution relationships, your ownership of a particular publisher or title list or imprint. If it is sold or changed, you need to get that information out to people so that they can be prepared to you know, receive the changes correctly uh, from the new source uh, or from you if you're the acquiring mm -hmm. uh, source. Yeah. And I think the timing of that is, in, is important too. Um, you know, a secondary source may come in a month later um, you know, and, and suddenly things are obscured, but um, good point. Thank you, Ralph. Um, I wanted to show, um, I know you're seeing the year two, uh, 2012 um, on the screen, and I know my time is short, um, so I won't perhaps go into, his, into this as depth. I know this is not new information to some of you, but I thought it was important that we bring up that this is this question, you know, why aren't my updates made? You know, it's not new. Um, but we've made a lot of progress. Um, in, in 2012, the BISG um, engaged Magellan Media um, to map the flow of metadata across the publishing supply chain. 
Um, and this report was the result. It is accessible from the BISG um, page. Um, if you're a member, you can get it right right now. Um, there is a there is a fee if you're a non-member, but please, you know, just if you can get it, get it. Um, and this meant a lot to me back in the day uh, because 2012 is back in the day. Um, you know, it's it basically was exploring, um, you know, how data updates were made across the 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 publishing supply chain um, and, inter and through a, a lot of interviews. I guess I won't go into too much details on that. But why am I bringing it up <laughs> if it's 10 years old? You know, 10 years ago, we were saying that, you know, only 36% of the potential changes made it through. Um, and that's not cool. Um, and I remember hearing that when Brian said it, thank you, Brian, um, for the first time and going, oh my gosh, first of all, I'm not alone. Other people are struggling. I thought maybe it was just me and my team. Um, and then also, oh my gosh, that's horrible. How can we be doing this better? And I think that um, we have done, um, we, we have made um, advances. If you wanna to go to the next slide, um, Brian, um, one of the things that um, this study recommended so this is 2012 and these are valid today, but just think about um, you know, how you may have been, how you work today, 10 years on. Um, you compare your data to the actual product, you know, create stronger feedback loops, talk, <laughs> um, you know, confirm the shared metadata definitions. If you mean, if page count means this to you, what does it mean to your sender or receiver? Um, it's all about communication. Um, and I think that um, one of the things that I did personally in my role was I took this study as a model and I unscientifically would send out tests. Like I'm changing a review. Who's gonna pick it up? Are they gonna make it the first review? Are they gonna make it the last review? Do they pick it up at all? Is it all jumbled? Um, and, and, you know, I just documented it on, my, on a notebook. You know, I wasn't doing anything scientific like this report was. Um, but it gave me so much insight into the timing of things that I would very much um, um, recommend that you do that. Focus on one title, focus on one data point for a month and a half, see what happens. Um, and that will hopefully, um, I don't know, get you uh, into a better uh, position to communicate with your recipients, okay? Um, and then it also, so um, if you wanna go to the next slide, um, Brian, it, this is, so it offers future-proofing updates. It actually uses the, the phrase future-proofing. And I just think that's um, great because it's future-proofing from the past, um, which, is, which is valid today. But um, think about how you may have changed or need to change your workflows as either a sender or a receiver. Um, do you prepare a weekly Delta file or do you accept a weekly Delta file, you know, on either side of the coin? Um, why or why not? And maybe that would be something you need to aspire to. Um, you need to think about the record for all formats, um, not just print book, not just ebook, both at the same time and audiobook. You know, they probably weren't even thinking audiobook back in 2012. Um, now the the um, point here about style tags, that was really important in 2012. Texts were all funky and all over the place. Whereas now the recipients um, and the senders have have come to a, a bit of an agreement about the use of HTML in, um, in Onyx. Um, although I know that certain um, recipients are laying down a hard line right now um, because they want it to display correctly for their consumers. But think about how you've changed your practices. And then also think about how, um, I know back in 2012, there were a lot of new supply chain entrants. There's perhaps not as many new entrants as there was back then, but they're still there. What do they want? What's the specification? Um, that they're working to. How can you learn from that? Um, and I think that that is um, really what we need to be doing here is, um, you know, we've, we've made a lot, we've made many great steps since 2012. And I know, I'm sure you in your um, companies, whether you're a sender or a receiver, have changed your processes and have tried to tighten things up, but there's still so much more to do. And really we need to remember that the ultimate goal is to make sure that the potential reader, be that a consumer, a library patron, whomever it might be, they see an accurate portrayal, an accurate representation of the book in the metadata so that they pick it up and read it. So I think that that's just important for us 
as people in this industry to appreciate that the end goal is to make sure that our content is discoverable and somebody finds it and reads it because that's what we're here to do. So with that, I think that we have not much time for questions, Brian. <laughs> I did see there was one question. There is actually, Anna is asking uh, if there's advice for smaller presses on prioritizing what data points to test or validate. I think we would say um, the validate, maybe it's a little bit different from the validation ideally should be with a schema. Um, so it's pretty full uh, rather than a DTD, but the most important points to focus on are actually enumerated in the, the report that you've been talking about, Claire, in 2012. There's an, an appendix of the, the critical metadata fields that- uh, Yeah, so. I'll just- I'll just that, go, go ahead, Mel. I was just going to quickly add to that, that just in terms of uh, files, that's an excellent point, Brian. I meant to bring that up about schema and XXD validation. Uh, it's a big difference from DTD. It's more stringent, but that's because Onyx 3.0 itself is more stringent in terms of populating the fields. So it's very important to use it uh, to make sure your files are valid and well-formed. And then in terms of just in general for a test files, I always tell people, please send us any currencies and formats you're planning to send in. I just had a situation with the provider. We went through a long test process and his original test file was just print data. And he wanted to send in print and ebook data together, which is an entirely different process for us. Yes. So uh, I would make sure you're upfront in terms of your what you have and what you need to get tested uh, with your providers. And Anna, I would, so, I think that um, main description text is the easiest place um, to see, you know, main description text is maybe is not as important as a price or an ISBN, um, but um, well, I mean, nothing's more important than an ISBN, right? But um, if you're gonna test something, do it in the main description text, make a, make a word bold, see who picks up that bold word. Um, you know, see, and then read your, um, the, the data, receivers, you know, the recipients, what kind of specification, what kind of advice are they putting out? Um, make, you don't have to have an Onyx DTD or schema to, to go through your data and see if you meet the requirements um, as maybe put out by, um, you know, I had an Onyx spec. I'm sure your recipients might have one too. Um, you, you can just read it and make sure do they want a page count. Do I have a page count? Um, you know, they want to have an addition number do I have an addition number? Um, so I, I think it's, you can do things without the technology, um, but ultimately, yeah, I mean, it's, it's best to, to follow the, you, to use the schema. Okay, we, we put together a short list of resources that include uh, the first link is the, is the report that Claire in particular has been talking about from 2012. We have a metadata best practices guide that was updated in 2018 and, and Claire is part of an effort right now to update it again uh, for Onyx 3. Uh, that, that update probably will take most of this year, but it's, uh, it's a big project for us and we're, we're thinking about presentation updates as well. And then I think you both, Ralph and Claire, talked about you know, being under, uh, understanding if you're a publisher, what your recipients uh, if they have guides or specifications and they can share them, it's a good place to start. And even if they don't have a document, having a conversation with them. Um, I think that's probably the, the core list of things that you should think about. Great. Um, we have, as I said, this is the fifth in, in the series that started last uh, September uh, of Met Coffee Break webinars. We're planning some more. Uh, we've got a, a planned update on the NISO guide to metadata for ebooks. We have a couple of people on the metadata committee, Pat Payton and Joshua Town, who worked on that update, and we're going to uh, present it in May. In June, we have a, a we're planning an update on blocks uh, and block updates. Uh, as as Ralph outlined, it's not a commonly used right now, but it's a potential thing that would reduce the demand on uh, recipients to process as much as they do. And then the last piece in August is to make price changes and managing sale prices. Um, we have a couple of other ideas on uh, in work. And if you have your own ideas on things you'd love to hear us talk about, share them with us at info at bisg.org. 
and we'll see if we can get uh, somebody in the committee to say yes, and we'll put it on a calendar. So, uh, Ralph or Claire, any last thoughts before we wrap up? I'll just say, I'm just really glad it's, it was nice just to hear from Claire herself at the beginning that uh, I've done a lot of presentations like this over time. And I do feel uh, in my time doing it that I have seen people pick up on the information uh, and we've seen improvements. I'm glad to hear it. it's benefited Claire. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know, recipients like uh, the companies I work and support, they want to get it right for you as quickly as possible, but they are dealing with volumes that uh, are quite high. And of course, your thing is the most important thing to you. So, you know, try to work with what they have so that uh, you can uh, get it uh, correct with them and for yourself as soon as possible. And, and I just wanted to add that if anybody is going to do any of the, the, the experimenting, like we explained, we'd love to hear about it. Um, it doesn't need to be scientific. Um, if it is scientific, that's great. <laughs> we would definitely love to hear about it. Um, but please, you know, as you go away and experiment, let us know what your results are. My impression is things have gotten better. Maybe that's not true. Um, I, we'd just love to hear from you. So the, the email address there, info at BISG.org, and it can get through to, to me and Ralph too. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Ralph, and thank you, Claire. I just wanted to call people's attention. There's one last edition that came in while Ralph was speaking from Chris Sainer at Editor with a link to the uh, schema the Editor makes available um, for validating files, uh, it's a particularly good resource. Um, and if, if you're not a member of our metadata committee uh, and you're interested in the work that we do, it's a great way to keep up to date uh, even beyond these webinars. All right. Thanks a lot for doing that today. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you again soon.